today, we have, uh, we're celebrating the life of Johnny Mullins, and uh, thanks to Melinda Mullins, who, as you'll see, has plenty of information on her dad and everything he's done. Now, if you go back to 1981, if you're old enough, there was a uh, Amy Lou Harris salutes, salutes Johnny Mullins concert at McDonald Arena, and I did that, or Ace Agency did, but it was my idea. John got Ron Myers and Bob McCroskey were Ace Agency, and the Undergrass Boys opened for them, and we were managing them at the time, and we booked it, and it was a great, great night in uh, Springfield, and uh, I got a bunch of stories. You know, Emmy Lou Harris is road manager at the time was one of the most notorious dudes there were i mean he, so and he they come into uh, uh mcdonald arena and we had this little area set up with flowers and stuff for uh Amy Lou and johnny to meet and he goes what's this stuff and we go what's well, for johnny mullins he goes who's johnny mullins and uh so we moved it out into the hall <laughs> and 10 minutes later Amy Lou walks in and goes where's johnny mullins so well, right here so anyway but it was it was a great a great uh, event, and I was proud to be part of it. My mom uh, knew him because she was a grade school cook at Sunshine Elementary, and he was a was there a year or so. But then he went, he went he was a janitor at other elementary schools. But uh, that's a family name was Johnny Mullins. So at this time, we'd like Melinda Mullins to come up and uh, do our program. Thanks. everybody. Bob, speaking about the um, concert back in 1981, in the middle of this display over here, there's a picture, uh, there's two pictures of Emmy Lou and Dad practicing a song together in the, uh, the dressing room that they performed on stage. And then underneath that, there's the picture of Emmy Lou who kissed Dad on stage. And boy, he never stopped talking about that. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. This is, um, this is very special. And it's, it's always a good opportunity to talk about my dad. So I'm just going to get right into it. And if anybody is on their lunch hour and they need to leave, don't worry. I won't be offended. And if, um, please, at some point, I'd love for you to come up and check out the presentation materials I have. And I also have some koozies and sampler CDs for sale. All right, the early years. Johnny Mullins was born in 1923 on October 23. He was in a log cabin in Ridgely, Missouri, which is in Barry County. And he had three brothers, and he had, no, he had three sisters and one brother. My mom's looking at me like, oh, she's doing it already. Well, get used to it. <laughs> and he also had a lot of creativity, and he had a lot of energy, because in the, the winter time, there was one, when he was two years old, he was running around and around and around in the, on the inside of the cabin, and he was holding his mother's wax comb. They made combs that you comb your hair out of with wax back in those days. And he was running so fast, he kind of got off balance, and that comb hit the hot wood stove. And it kind of caught on fire, and it melted, and it burnt off Johnny Mullen's finger. And so in between the two knuckles, he never did have a full finger from the time he was two years on. And it, it never stopped him from playing guitar. And actually, it was kind of a fun little trick because we had fun with it, and the kids at um, the elementary schools had fun. And I remember the neighbors and the, the kids around the neighborhood would say, Mr. Mullins, let's do that finger thing. Because see, when it was cut off, it had a wart on one side and a wart on the other side. And it looked like a horse's head. So we were always doing this little thing, and we'd do it through church. It would keep me pacified for a long time. They have the two horses that are starting to get to know each other, and they're scared. They get to know each other, and they're scared. And ultimately, however long it takes, they become friends. So not that many people know. If you look at some pictures of my dad, you can kind of see that his, his one finger uh, is shorter. And that's why he played guitar without a pick. And that's also why he played an 11-string guitar string, or 11-string, 12-string guitar. He had the, uh, the G string, was, did not have the little one on it. Um, he was, had an eighth grade education. But he sure had a brilliant mind. A lot of the, um, of the grammar that he ended up learning as far as proper writing and punctuation and those things was learned from uh, the school teachers that he followed around um, when he was a janitor. 
Um, the upbringing of being rural, it, le it leads to a lot of inspiration. You know, when you're out in the field, you think of a lot of different things. Um, and it also gives you reason to have a lot of humor. He told a DJ once, he said, you know, when I'm out plowing and I stub my toe on a big old rock and it hurts so bad, I'm not gonna yell and I'm not gonna scream, I'm not gonna whine, I'm just gonna start singing so I'll pretend like I'm Ernest Tubb. And I guess Ernest Tubb sounds a little bit like somebody hurt his toe, I don't know. <laughs> but he, he started writing songs and, um, and just having a lot of words coming out of his, his head when he was a kid and decided that he needed a guitar. So in the summer of, um, I guess he was about eight or nine years old, he worked picking cherries or strawberries for the months of June, July, and August in Barry County, Missouri. So he earned that $10 to buy that guitar from the sweat of his brow. And when he did, he realized that he had to play it. And he didn't ever really have the desire to become a fancy musician. And he realized that he just wanted to get the songs out. He wanted to be a singer. So he learned D and G and A and E and maybe the simple chords that he needed to learn. But he started writing songs and his very first one came out of his head and it also allowed him to be able to go into the cabin to practice music because when he first started playing guitar or practicing it, he had to go practice up in the barn loft. He was so bad. And uh, he decided that he didn't want to have to stay in the barn loft. So he came up with Hey, look, sitting on yonder hill, hovered by a bush, all quiet and still. Get your finger on the trigger and your shoulder on the gun, and you better do it quick, cause the rabbit's gonna run. Eatle I D and a eatle I do, rabbit in the briar patch, better get him out. No one second thought, better let him go. Eatle I D and a eatle I do. And that, so far, uh, to this day, is the, the very first Johnny Mullen song that we know about. But it most certainly was not the last. He, um, when he was about 17 years old, he decided to branch out and go see the world. So he left the Ozarks and went to work in the Kansas wheat fields. And then he went to Nebraska and he was working in the uh, CCC, which is Civilian Conservation Corps. And um, he was building, digging ditches, building a lot of infrastructure, roads, and working with the park system, you know, building cabins and that type of thing. And he really wanted to be in the Army, but he had broke his hip from swinging from a rope swing down at the creek when he was a kid. And he kind of misjudged where you're supposed to let go. And he recovered from that injury, but the Army didn't think that he was um, suitable to be a soldier. So he um, did not go in the Army. And this, this story might be a whole lot different if he had. But he went over to the West Coast, and he became a lumberjack in the Dalles, Oregon. And a lot of the things that he saw and witnessed over there um, inspired him creatively. And, and he started not only continuing to sing, but he started doing some performances. And he got on the radio. There was a radio station, KODL, in the Dalles, Oregon. And that was one of his jobs when he wasn't doing the lumber. Another one of his jobs was candling eggs, where you hold a candle up behind an egg and you can tell by however th how thick it is whether the egg is still good or not. And uh, he didn't like that as much as singing, though. I, don't, I wonder if he ever wrote a song about egg candling. I'll have to check my, check my resources on that. But his favorite thing was doing the radio shows. And they called him the yodeling cowboy from the Ozarks. And I don't really remember Dad yodeling much in his, his later years, but I guess when he was, I think I, think I have it figured out, though, because he said he loved that job because he was sitting there, and his microphone, there was a big window, and the window looked out on the sidewalk and the street. And all the girls from town would come and stand on the sidewalk and sit on the curb and sit on the cars and swing their legs and look at that man playing guitar. So I... Uh, I think that might have been when he first started writing his first love songs, too. <laughs> um, doing that type of life, he started going down the West Coast, and he did play in a few um, you know, bars and honky-tonks and realized immediately that that was not the life he wanted, and it also wasn't how he wanted his music heard. And I can only imagine what, you know, back in the 1940s, what the... Um, you know, after the Depression, what those clubs, probably, no, I wouldn't even call them clubs, they were probably pretty rough. 
but he traveled down the West Coast and hit a few of those, but decided that he wanted to come on home. So he came home to the Ozarks, and he moved up to Springfield, and in 1951, he started hauling milk for Producers Creamery. There's a picture of him on this display, and man, he had some muscles on him, because he was hauling those, those big old milk cans, and you swing those things up, and you swing them down, you sling them around, and makes me have to stretch for a second just thinking about it. <laughs> and he worked there for a few years, and then he worked for um, Ozark Manufacturing Company, which produced um, gold bond furniture. And in the upholstery department of the gold bond furniture company, there's this pretty little woman named Peggy Mullins, or Peggy Hawkins at the time. And Johnny Mullins figured out as many ways, as many times of a day that he could deliver something to the upholstery department. Every day, he's like, I think they need some nails in there. I think they need some glue. <laughs> So in 1956, uh, Peggy Hawkins became Peggy Mullins, and that was an exciting time for them. It was also a really exciting time in Springfield because the Ozark Jubilee was in its heyday. It had gone from only being on radio to having um, a television show that was weekly, had so many people coming into our town to attend the Jubilee, to perform in it, to just be close to it. Um, it was really an exciting time for everybody. I think uh, there's a picture of my mom standing in front of the Jewel Theater, and I think that might have been a, a few of the places that Daddy took her for a date. Um, but before the marriage, I'm going to go back a couple years, he was hanging out close to the, um, the Jubilee area, and there's a diner downtown, and it's now called, what well, used to be called Uncle Fudd's. And he met this fella, and they sat down and introduced each other, and this man said, well, my name's Porter Wagner, and I just moved up here from West Plains because the Ozark Jubilee's here. And Dad said, well, my name's Johnny Mullins, and I'm a songwriter. And Porter said, well, if you ever have anything that you think might be um, something I could sing, because I don't have any hits yet, you know, then come on by my, my office in the KWTO building down on Glenstone. Well, he had a little something. Oh, mama, I'm excited. I'm almost out of breath. What I saw a lot to made me run myself to death. I was on the mountainside and I looked down below. Glory be, I thought I'd better come and let you know that we got company coming. <laughs> He took that song to, um, to get a de demo recorder of it. At that, this point in time, he didn't have any of his own equipment. And there was a fella that lives in Central Springfield. His name was Virgil Williams. And he had a little recording studio in his garage. And he had people um, like Jimmy Gately and Harold Morrison and Paul Mitchell and Speedy Hayworth. And they would help musicians out doing their demos. So they whooped up a, a demo of Companies Coming, and Dad took it over to that KWTO building. And Cy Simon from Earl Barton Music was there, and Porter Wagner and Red Foley. Well, they put that thing in the machine, and they listened to it. And Cy Simon turned the machine off. And Red Foley looked at Porter, and he said, if you don't record that, I'm going to, because that's a hit. And uh, so Porter did record it, and it was one of the top country songs of 1954. And Red Foley ended up singing it a lot because it opened up the uh, Ozark Jubilee show quite a few times. In fact, that song, it was recorded by, um, recorded or performed by Red Foley, Norma Jean, Farron Young, Jack Benny, Tennessee Ernie Ford, Danny Kaye, Mickey Mouse, uh, Mel Tillis. It was translated into the French language in 1970, and um, it opened up the Ozark Jubilee. It opened up Silver Dollar City, uh, the park. The Homestead Pickers sang that at the very opening of the park for years and years. And, and still, Mom and I will hear somebody say, oh, we heard the company's come and open a certain show down in Branson or some theme park down in Florida. Or it's, um, it's one of those songs that really lasts. And uh, it also took Dad to Nashville for the first time. In 1955, he flew down there for a BMI award for one of the top country songs of 1954. So when he was in Nashville, he met the Wilburn brothers, who had their company, uh, Surefire Music. And he, he ha ended up having a very long-term <clears throat> term friendship with Cy Simon um, and Doyle and Teddy um, Wilburn. And that was how it helped him get his foot in the door and get some of these songs to people. 
We used to go out walking hand in hand. You told me all the big things you had planned. It wasn't long till all your dreams came true. It's funny what success has done to you. Daddy wrote that song and had given it to the Wilburn Brothers. And in 1962, there was a little lady named Loretta Lynn. And she had just signed to Decca Records. And she didn't have any uh, hits under her belt. And um, that was until she recorded that song. And that became a top 10 hit for Loretta. And that really started boosting Dad's um, excitement and his ability to uh, continue you know, when you start getting things like that happening, he just wanted to write more and write more and write more. And uh, Loretta asked him to write a song f specifically for her. And so he thought, well, she's got pretty blue eyes, and she's from Kentucky. So he wrote Blue Kentucky Girl in 1964. In fact, he wrote it sitting on the front porch of a little rock house at the corner of State and Fort. That was where mom and dad lived um, before I was born. And they had, uh, had adopted my sister at that point in 1960, who, I'll make this very short, but my, six, my sister is my third cousin, my dad's second cousin. We live in the Ozarks. <laughs> it was, it was uh, on my dad's side of the family, there was a death in the family, and there was need, and there was a lot of love. So Sharon K. Day entered our family, and at that point in time, Mom didn't think that she could have any children. But a few years later, surprise! <laughs> so he wrote, um, he wrote Blue Kentucky Girl, and that one was another good hit for Loretta. And bounced forward about 15 years, and Mr. Rodney Crowell went to his friend Emmy Lou Harris, and he said, you know, I think you ought to do this cover, this old Loretta Lynn tune. And she was playing with the hot band back in those days. And they did an album and included that as the cover, um, the lead song for that album. And that was in 79. And oh my goodness, that started changing some things. That's the song that took the uh, Springfield skinny little janitor from Wilder Elementary School, uh, took him out to Hollywood for the Grammys. And, and Dad had been working as a janitor for probably since the early 60s. And that was an incredible time. I can remember, I think it was probably because he was a janitor that it just became such a huge thing. I mean, internationally, all over, people were, they were calling, they were sending cards and letters, and going to the P.O. box every day was just this extremely giddy and exciting and sometimes dad would let me have the key and go in and open it myself but he'd always say make sure you get it shut good <laughs> so and then I'd get in the car and I'd swear sometimes he'd go in there to make sure I got it shut good <laughs> but it was so thrilling because people were writing and um, tv stations were calling um, tele television radio um, there were magazines uh, it was just everybody was so intrigued by the story of this humble man that had this big hit and was going to be putting a tux on and going to the Grammys. And uh, there was also one of the biggest and most exciting assemblies at Wilder Elementary School that had ever taken place, and I don't know if it ever will again. About 500 kids um, gave Dad a send-off that was just incredible. There's some pictures on this. Um, this board from it, and they snuck all those kids into the assembly room, you know, where the cafeteria is, and Dad's janitor room was right next to that, and he, he always said, I never did know how they got those kids to be quiet enough to sneak in there, and then one of the, somebody called him, they paged him, and he walked out, and it was, what? <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. And they had collected money enough to send uh, Mom and I to get us a plane ticket to go out to Hollywood with Dad. So it was a big, happy deal. And he did not win his Grammy, and we, we didn't even care. You know, Loretta won for her album entitled Blue Kentucky Girl. But it was, it, it really opened the floodgates of interest and having people contact dad he started he previously he had done performances in places like um fantastic caverns which i would really love for them to start having that going again and um you know little 
like Doling Park uh, would have trail dances and he'd seen companies come in there. And, but after the Grammys, people sought him out for um, a, lot of, a lot of shows, a lot of community activities, um, churches, TV, a lot of radio. It was, um, it was very exciting. I think I'll talk a little bit about his lifestyle. It's early in the morning when everything is still, and the only thing that's moving is the fox out on the hill. Well, then the Lord dials your number, cause he knows you're listening in. Cause in the noisy nighttime, he may not call again. Dad woke up at 5 o'clock or before 5 o'clock a.m. every morning. And he always wanted, that was his time to write because the earth was still, the house was still, and um, I guess his yapping little daughter was, <laughs> wasn't crawling all over his lap. And he had a study that a lot of times he would, if he had ideas brewing in his head, he would just, he had a little bed in there and he would just sleep there so he could get up early and write. And um, our little bitty house was so small that when I was growing up, part of his study was my playroom. And I think back on it now, and I think that's kind of how all this music started getting into my blood at an early age. Um, he loved being a janitor. You know, people were always telling him, you know, Johnny, you need to move to Nashville. You could, you could be a much more successful songwriter. You could be a successful performer, because he had a really good voice. And, or you can join a publishing house. You can co-write. There's all these opportunities, because a lot of people had moved to Nashville after the Ozark Jubilee disbanded here in Springfield. And it was, I mean, a mass exodus. And... He, Dad would go down there, on, usually on a bus. He didn't really like taking the plane, plus it was expensive. And he'd go down there and he'd spend time with, um, with the, the Wilburn brothers and with the friends that he made down there. And he would always have cassette tapes loaded up in a briefcase and in every pocket he could possibly find, and maybe some even stuffed in his socks. <laughs> you know, Because at that point, you didn't give somebody a download card. You had to actually give them a physical uh, cassette tape or reel to reel and um, and the lyrics so he he enjoyed those getaway trips but he wanted his family to be raised in the Ozarks he wanted to be a janitor and you know I'm really glad he did because I hear so many stories I mean when I was a kid I thought my dad was a celebrity not really for the songwriting it was because everywhere we went it was Mr. Mullins Mr. Mullins Mr. Mullins he um, he was the songwriting janitor People knew that he would sing, and the teachers used him as a, a tool at times, saying, if you don't behave, you can't go to the assembly where Mr. Mullins is going to sing, and that would work. And he played a lot of games. It was, um, he was actually a very smart, smart man. He would play games with the students, and whoever won the game, they won the right to do dad's work. <laughs> so you'd see, you'd see these boys with the biggest grins on their face and just strutting it while they're folding up all the chairs and they're loading them on the dolly. And, and they used to play a game for who could turn on and off the lights. I mean, it was, it was always a, a pretty exciting time. And, and he was also very kind. I, I've had people come up to me since I've started sharing his music and his story, and they'll, they'll tell me some really touching um, stories. He, he would notice when somebody had a problem, and um, there was a woman that came up to me a few months ago, and she said that she had transferred to Wilder and didn't have any friends, and she had left all her other friends, and her mom and dad weren't together anymore, and she had stopped, and she had dropped her books, and she got down on her knees, and she was crying. And dad went over to her, and he you know, was helping her pick up her books, and he said, well, what's wrong? And so she started telling him, you know, I just moved here. I don't know anybody. I don't know any friends. I don't know the schoolwork. And, and um, he gave her a pat on the back and helped her with the books, and he said, well, things will get better. You hang in there. 
And she said, Melinda, within a day, I had people coming up to me saying they wanted to know my name. I had the teachers giving me a little bit of extra smiles during the day and people coming out on the, um, the playground. And, and she said, I had friends by the end of the week. And um, she thinks that, that Johnny Mullins had a little bit of something to do with that. He just had a huge heart. And he loved sharing. He shared his songwriting with his family. He shared his ideas. He shared the songs. He'd come out and get our opinion on them. And uh, mom was very honest about it. Just, I, sometimes I'd say, oh, usually I just like, I love it, I love it. And there were a few songs that was like, oh, that one's kind of a stinker. <laughs> But he, so the ones that were stinkers ended up being good jokes. He could say, you know, I bet nobody in this restaurant realizes that I'm the man that wrote Feathers of a Buzzards and Bones of a Mule. <laughs> it's a, it is a stinker of a song. I've got that one. Um, and he also loved sharing with, um, with friends. He, Dad loved community. He loved going to coffee shops and hanging out at the uh, KWTO building. He, he loved hanging out at the old KSMU building with Mr. Mike Smith there. And, um, and Mike and all these people, they would, see, I also thought, in addition to thinking that my dad was this huge celebrity, I thought that my mom was rich because mom used to take in uh, babysitting and she also ironed for people. So when these doctors and lawyers would come and pick up their ironing, they would pay her and she always had this big bag of you know, nickels and dimes and quarters and a few dollar bills, and maybe a five here and there. Well, dad knew where that packet of, of money was, so that's what he used for his coffee shop excursions. <laughs> I can remember I'd, I'd be in the, in the floor playing and he'd look down at me, getting that money out, and he'd just kinda Give me that little wink, and off he would go. And uh, I know he, he really had a special friendship with Mike Smith. And, um, he would meet me at Anton's, and we'd sneak coffee, or he would have. Yeah, he wasn't, supposed to, he wasn't supposed to drink coffee, but I guess when you go to a coffee shop, it's a little tempting. <laughs> but yeah, Anton's, um, Aunt Martha's, Sambo's, back when Sambo's used to be out on... Um, West Sunshine and just a, a lot of a lot of places. And he and he enjoyed going to church. He was just a all around regular guy with a whole lot of talent. He wrote songs basically about anything and everything. It was things that he garnered from his own experiences or his observations. And um, all different types. He had songs that were bluegrass. She's my mountain rose, flower of my heart. I found her here amongst the rocks and reels. If anyone should ask me where I've gone, just say I'm with an angel in the hills. And he wrote country songs. Everything's gone at the scene of my childhood. Loved ones have left with the passing of time. Rotted sawdust and a few old stray timbers are all that is left of the old genuine. He wrote songs that were honky-tonk songs. I didn't realize that until I started getting into uh, the archives of his music. He always, he didn't tell me about that. And I thought, when I finally found him, I was like, Dad! But he's, he was very protective of, of me, as you can imagine. But he did write honky-tonk songs. I know it's three in the morning, and I don't need your warning. I know he's out somewhere on the town. He wrote story songs. The only thing that keeps a man from sleeping is the glass rolled down in the cool night air. And the only thing that keeps him from dreaming it's the night wind blowing through his coal black hair. Back in the late 50s and early 60s and up into the very beginning of the 70s, there were songs called recitations. And Dad wrote several of those, and he had several recorded by um, Porter Wagner and the Wilburn Brothers. Um, there was one that I think I'm, I need to pull out of the archives and learn it because I have a feeling it's going to come in real handy this next year. It's called, um, I Dreamed I Saw America on Her Knees. 
she knelt in prayer with humble, outstretched hands. And he wrote a lot of humorous songs, kid songs, you know. I'm just an old man with a long white beard and buttermilk on my bib. I don't wash the buttermilk off, my whiskers keep it hid. I'm just an old man trying to get by with one good ear and one bad eye. I fish every day, if I did not die, I'm just an old man. <laughs> so we had quite a, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of material there. And in the later years, Dad retired from the school system in 1982. And at first, he said he felt like a puppy that had been laid off at the side of the road in a ditch. He just didn't know where to go and what to do. Uh, but he found things to do. He continued to write songs, and he, he branched out into, um, he had always written poems, but he started doing some short songs, um, short stories, and he actually wrote some novels. Um, he had one of them published. It was called Teacher Wade's Last Gunfight. And he had some other manuscripts, and it was right around this time that Dad told me uh, some really good lessons, some things that I'm drawing on now in my <clears throat> adult life. <laughs> but he, he talked about hot air balloons. And because of Dad's success with the Grammys and um, just being this person that, that was so approachable and seemed like such kind of a hillbilly, um, he had a lot of people that would say, oh, Johnny, have I got a proposition for you? Or, oh, Johnny, let's do this. Um, we're going to make a movie about your life story. Or, oh, Johnny, we're going to get you involved in writing the entire score for a movie. Or, oh, Johnny. And, you know, some of the things did happen. And a lot of them were very well-intentioned. I mean, stuff happens. Um, but after a few disappointments, you learn to temper and curb your enthusiasm and, and base your hopes. It's, there's nothing wrong with being hopeful, but you just have to be realistic. And that's when things do work out that makes life so grand. And he used to say, um, keep your head out of the clouds, because down here is where the pencils are. Smart man. <laughs> He had a book written about him called America's Favorite Janitor, and that was in uh, the mid-80s. A uh, fellow down in Monette, Missouri, um, Hino Head Jr. wrote it. There's a, a copy over here, and I hadn't read it in quite a while, and last um, winter I, I dug it out, and I tell you, it's a really good book. That He writes really well, and it, it basically covers Dad's life story from life <laughs> and up, and up through the Grammys. and. Um, the funny thing I was thinking about this weekend, when this book came out, like the big book tour, the places that, that sold Dad's book and he went to for book signings, they were mom and pop grocery stores, they were um, local bookstores, they were flea markets, um, consumers market over on Sunshine Street had them. You know, he would go down to a place in West Plains or he would go to a, a tea house that was selling them out by the cash register somewhere down in Yellville, Arkansas. And at the time, I remember thinking, oh, that is so lame. <laughs> and I was kind of embarrassed by it. And now I'm so proud because that is true Americana. Um, and there's, there's still books available, um, but they're quite the collector's item these days. I'm not done. <laughs> in uh, 1996, Dad did his last show at the Landers Theater, and in 1997, he um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and in about 1998, Dad came to my house and gave me a guitar and let me know that he didn't think he'd be able to be doing the songs anymore, and uh, that was a real turning point in our family. I um, I had never played guitar before because I just didn't need to, I guess, or maybe I was too lazy to practice. That's very likely, isn't it, Mom? <laughs> uh, but once I realized that things were changing in our family and there was all this, there were all these songs, I thought, well, I can learn to play a D chord or a G chord or a C chord or an A or an E, maybe a B, <laughs> just enough to, because Dad's songs, uh, word-wise, they can be very deep, but the chording of them is, is pretty simple. So I started learning to play guitar a little bit, and I would go to like a festival, and if we're sitting around a campfire or at some music party, 
I'd, uh, I'd pull out a song and I'd sing Companies Coming or Forks of the Branch or um, something like, the window is open, so why don't you fly? Could it be that you lost the yearning to try? Your cage is a prison, they kept you so long. But wings are for flying and a throat for a song. And people would say, well, who, where's that song? Where'd that song come from? And I'd be like, well, that's my daddy's song, Johnny Mullins. He's an old-time country songwriter. And, and they'd say, well, I like that song. Can I learn it? And I'm like, well, yeah, you can. And that, that really started a wonderful uh, progression that's been happening over several years, and especially the last three years, to where people are wanting to learn Johnny Mullins songs, and they're wanting to perform in them, and they're wanting to record them. And I, you know, he's been recorded, and these are not the hit songs. These are, these are the songs that I call the shoebox collection, because there are hundreds of songs that I'm in the process of discovering and archiving. Um, but he's been recorded by Big Smith. Um, Casey Roush up in Kansas City, who's a disc jockey and a video jockey, and she's recorded many albums. She's just a phenomenal musician. She's recorded about five Johnny Mullins songs. I think a lot of people in Kansas City know more about Johnny Mullins than in Springfield almost. She's a, a big promoter of his. Um, Shannon Stein and um, the Millers and High Strung and the Finley River Boys just recorded It's Been a Good Day. Uh, they just gave a copy to Mom last night at Luttrell's. And then locally we've got people um, like Chad Graves from the Hillbenders, he does a couple of dad's songs. Uh, Sugar Thumb, Dallas Jones, Brett Miller, Chad Elliott, thump, 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 thump. He's a, uh, if you don't know who he is, you should look him up. He is, he's from um, Coon Ridge, Iowa, Coon Rapids, Iowa, but he is an amazing songwriter. And the fact that he still, he does a Johnny Mullins song, and he told me, he was at a house concert recently, and he said, I do your dad's song almost every show I do, and I'm like, Really? Because he's, he has so many great songs himself. And he said, it's just such a good song. So that, that means a lot. Um, and then there's Bo Brown, who comes into this mix as somebody I'm very grateful for. Because when I started realizing that I wanted to share my dad's legacy, I, um, I needed to start learning how to play music. And Bo helped me arrange songs. He helped me. He got excited about it, too, which is really nice, because we, um, it's just a really, it's a labor of love. It's a lot of work. And, but the progression that, that's happened in the last three years from just starting to sing Johnny Mullen's songs out to where we, we would have like a 20 minute set. And now it's to the point where whether I'm playing with Bo or playing solo, I can do three hours of Johnny Mullen's music and I'm not done. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Get by with a lot of help from my friends. You know, we've, we've been able to, um, to do Johnny Mullen's songs at, there's been a lot of airplay. We've had a lot of really good gig bookings. We've uh, been on KSMU Studio Live back in 2013, and we're gonna be performing there again in June. Um, we've played the Ozark Celebration Festival. We got invited to do Johnny Mullen's songs at the uh, Folk Alliance International in Kansas City last year, which was a really big deal. Um, we had the honor of performing and telling some stories about Dad on the Go Bluegrass TV show, which airs on Channel 27, 6.30 Sunday nights, and it's also on Blue Highway TV. Oh, we got to open up at the Gilloy's Theater as the opening act for Mark Blue and Cindy Wolf's CD release. That was a, a really big night. I got to sing Johnny Mullen's songs at Stage 5 at Winfield this year. And I got asked to um, present a presentation at Music Monday at the Ozarks. <laughs> so I, think, I think we all share in the excitement of, um, of Johnny Mullins. And that's, that's I, only, I don't do it just for myself. I, I feel like I'm a vessel. You know, I, I can get really excited about his work and about who he is because I'm not talking about how great something is that I did. I just, I'm very proud of him, and I want his music to live on for a very long time. So um, I appreciate you guys coming. The support of everybody is phenomenal. The support and the feedback has been great. I just have one more thing to say. It's from one of his recitations. 
Well, the music stopped and the people left, and he put the guitar back in his case. Then like a little girl will sometimes do, well, I got right up in his face. Oh, I really like your singing, mister. I mean, to me, it sounds mighty fine. I could sit here all day long and listen to you singing your songs. I'm not lying. I could tell that he was very old as he placed a wrinkled hand in mine. Sweet girl, would you like to have a guitar and learn these songs of mine? See, somebody's got to keep singing them, and well, I know I ain't got long. So if I teach you some chords on this here guitar, will you sing my songs when I'm gone? <laughs>